Winter Sunshine by John Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Winter Sunshine by John Burroughs. An American resident in England is reported as saying that the English have an atmosphere but no climate. The reverse of this remark would apply pretty accurately to our own case. We certainly have a climate, a two-edged one, that cuts both ways, threatening us with sunstroke on the one hand and with froststroke on the other. But we have no atmosphere to speak of in New York and New England, except now and then during the dog days or the fitful and uncertain Indian summer. An atmosphere, the quality of tone and mellowness in the near distance, is the product of a more humid climate. Hence, as we go south from New York, the atmospheric effects become more rich and varied, until, on reaching the Potomac, you find an atmosphere as well as a climate. The latter is still on the vehement American scale, full of sharp and violent changes and contrasts, baking and blistering in summer, and nipping and blighting in winter, but the spaces are not so purged and bare. The horizon wall does not so often have the appearance of having just been washed and scrubbed down. There is more depth and visibility to the open air, a stronger infusion of the Indian summer element throughout the year, than is found further north. The days are softer and more brooding, and the nights more enchanting. It is here that Walt Whitman saw the full moon. Pour down night's nimbus floods. As one may see her during the fall from October to May, there is more haze and vapor in the atmosphere during that period, and every particle seems to collect and hold the pure radiance until the world swims with the lunar outpouring. Is not the full moon always on the side of fair weather? I think it is Sir William Herschel who says her influence tends to dispel the clouds. Certain it is her beauty that is seldom lost or even veiled in this southern or semi-southern clime. Floods of the yellow gold of the gorgeous, indolent, sinking sun, burning, expanding the air. A description that would not apply with the same force further north, where the air seems thinner and less capable of absorbing and holding the sunlight. Indeed, the opulence and splendor of our climate, at least the climate of the Atlantic seaboard, cannot be fully appreciated by the dweller north of the thirty-ninth parallel. It seems as if I have never seen but a second-rate article of sunlight or moonlight until I had taken up my abode in the national capital. It may be, perhaps, because we have such splendid specimens of both at the period of the year when one values such things highest, namely in the fall and winter and early spring. Sunlight is good any time, but a bright, evenly-tempered day is certainly more engrossing to the attention in the winter than in summer, and such days seems the rule, and not the exception in the Washington winter. The deep snows keep to the north, the heavy rains to the south, leaving a blue space central over the border states, and there is not one of the winter months but wears this blue zone as a girdle. I am not thinking especially of the Indian summer, that charming but uncertain second youth of the New England year, but of regularly recurring lucid intervals in the weather system of Virginia fall and winter, when the best our climate is capable of stand revealed, southern days with northern blood in their veins, exhilarating, elastic, full of action, the hyperborean oxygen of the north tempered by the dazzling sun of the south, a little bitter in winter to all travellers, but the pedestrian, to him sweet and warming, but in autumn, a vintage that intoxicates all lovers of the open air. It is impossible not to dilate and expand under such skies. One breathes deeply and steps profoundly, and if he have any of the eagle nature in him, it comes to the surface then. There is a sense of altitude above these dazzling November and December days, of mountain tops and pure ether. The earth, in passing through the fire of summer, seems to have lost all its dross, and life all its impediments. But what does not the dweller in the national capital endure in reaching these days? Think of the agonies of the heated term, the ragings of the dog-star, the purgatory of heat and dust, of baking, blistering pavements, 
of cracked and powdered fields, of dead, stifling night air, from which every tonic and antiseptic quality seems eliminated, leaving a residuum of sultry malaria, and all diffusing privy and sewer gases, that last from the first of July to near the middle of September. But when October is reached, the memory of these things is far off, and the glory of the days is perpetual surprise. I sally out in the morning with the ostensible purpose of gathering chestnuts or autumn leaves or persimmons, or exploring some run or branch. It is, say, the last of October or the first of November. The air is not balmy, but tart and pungent, like the flavor of the red-cheeked apples by the roadside. In the sky, not a cloud, not a speck, a vast dome of blue ether, lightly suspended above the world. The woods are heaped with color, like a painter's palette, great splashes of red and orange and gold. The ponds and streams bear upon their bosoms leaves of all tints, from the deep maroon of the oak to the pale yellow of the chestnut. In the glens and nooks it is so still that the chirp of a solitary cricket is noticeable. The red berries of the dogwood and spice-bush and other shrubs shine in the sun like rubies and coral. The crows fly high above the earth, as they do only on such days. Forms of ebony floating across the azure, and the buzzards look like kingly birds sailing round and round. Or it may be later in the season, well into December. The days are equally bright, but a little more rugged. The mornings are ushered in by an immense spectrum thrown upon the eastern sky. A broad bar of red and orange lies along the low horizon surmounted by an expanse of color in which green struggles with yellow and blue with green half the way to the zenith by and by the red and orange spread upward and grow dim the spectrum fades and the sky becomes suffused with yellow-white light and in a moment the fiery scintillations of the sun begin to break across the maryland hills then before long the mists and vapors uprise like the breath of a giant army and for an hour or two one is reminded of a november morning in england but by mid-forenoon the only trace of the obscurity that remains is a slight haze and the day is indeed a summons and a challenge to come forth if the october days were a cordial like the sub-acids of a fruit these are the tonic like the wine of iron drink deep or be careful how you taste this december vintage the first sip may chill but a full draught warms and invigorates. No loitering by the brooks, or in the woods now, but spirited, rugged walking along the public highway. The sunbeams are welcome now. They seem like pure electricity, like a friendly and recuperating lightning. Are we led to think electricity abounds only in the summer, when we see storm clouds, as it were, the veins and ore beds of it? I imagine it is equally abundant in winter and more equable and better tempered. Whoever breasted a snowstorm without being excited and exhilarated, as if this meteor had come charged with latent aurora of the north, as doubtless it has. It is like being pelted with sparks from a battery. Behold the frostwork on the pane, the wild, fantastic linings and etchings. Can there be any doubt but this subtle agent has been here? Where is it not? It is the life of the crystal the artifact of the flake, the fire of the frost, the soul of the sunbeam. This crisp winter air is full of it. When I come in at night, after an all-day tramp, I am charged like a laden jar. My hair crackles and snaps, beneath the comb like a cat's back, and a strange new glow diffuses itself through my system. It is a spur that one feels at this season more than any other. How nimbly you step forth! The woods roar, the waters shine, and the hills look invitingly near. You do not miss the flowers and the songsters, or wish the trees or the fields any different, or the heavens any nearer. Every object pleases. A rail fence, running athwart the hills, now in sunshine and now in shadow. How the eye lingers upon it, or the straight, light gray trunks of the trees, where the woods have recently been laid open by a road or clearing. How curious they look, and as if surprised in undress. 
Next year they will begin to shoot out branches and make themselves a screen. Or the farm scenes, the winter barnyards littered with husks and straw, the rough-coated horses, the cattle sunning themselves or walking down to the spring to drink, the domestic fowls moving about. There is a touch of sweet, homely life in these things that the winter sun enhances and brings out. Every sign of life is welcome at this season. I love to hear the dogs bark, hens cackle and boys shout. One has no privacy with nature now, and does not wish to seek her in nooks and hidden ways. She is not at home if he goes there. Her house is shut up and her hearth cold. Only the sun and sky, and perchance the waters, wear the old look, and to-day we will make love to them, and they shall abundantly return it even the crows and buzzards draw the eye fondly the national capital is a great place for buzzards and i make the remark in no double or allegorical sense either for the buzzards i mean are black and harmless as doves though perhaps hardly dove-like in their tastes my vulture is also a bird of leisure and sails through the ether on long flexible pinions as if that were the one delight of his life some birds have wings others have pinions the buzzard enjoys this latter distinction there is something in the sound of the word that suggests that easy dignified undulatory movement he does not propel himself along by sheer force of muscle after the plebeian fashion of the crow for instance but progresses by a kind of royal indirection that puzzles the eye even on a windy winter day he rides the vast aerial billows as placidly as ever, rising and falling as he comes up towards you, carving his way through the resisting currents by a slight oscillation to the right and left, but never once beating the air openly. This superabundance of wing power is very unequally distributed among the feathered races, the hawks and vultures having by far the greater share of it. They cannot command the most speed, but their apparatus seems the most delicate and consummate. Apparently, a fine play of muscle, a subtle shifting of the power along the outstretched wings, a perpetual loss and a perpetual recovery of the equipoise sustains them and bears them along. With them flying is a luxury, a fine art, not merely a quicker and safer means of transit from one point to another, but a gift so free and spontaneous that work becomes leisure and movement rest. They are not so much going somewhere, from this perch or that, as they are abandoning themselves to the mere pleasure of riding upon the air. And it is beneath such grace and high-bred leisure that nature hides in her creatures the occupation of scavenger and carrion-eater. But the worst thing about the buzzard is his silence. The crow caws, the hawk screams, the eagle barks, but the buzzard says not a word. So far as I have observed, he has no vocal powers whatever. Nature dare not trust him to speak. In his case, she preserves discreet silence. The crow may not have the sweet voice which the fox, in his flattery, attributed to him, but he has a good, strong, native speech nevertheless. How much character there is in it, how much thrift and independence. Of course, his plumage is firm, his color decided, his wit quick. He understands you at once and tells you so. So does the hawk by his scornful, defiant whirr. Hardy, happy outlaws, the crows, how I love them, alert, social, republican, always able to look out for himself, not afraid of the cold and the snow, fishing when flesh is scarce, and stealing when other resources fail. The crow is a character I would not willingly miss from the landscape. I love to see his track in the snow or the mud, and his graceful pedestrianism about the brown fields. He is no interloper, but has the air and manner of being thoroughly at home and in the right possession of the land. He is no sentimentalist like some of the plaining, disconsolate songbirds, but apparently is always in good health and good spirits. No matter who is sick or dejected or unsatisfied or what the weather is or what the price of corn, the crow is well and finds life sweet. He is the dusky embodiment of worldly wisdom and prudence. Then he is one of nature's self-appointed constables 
and greatly magnifies his office. He would fain arrest every hawk or owl or grimalkin that ventures abroad. I have known a posse of them to beset the fox and cry thief, till Reynard hid himself for shame. Do I say the fox flattered the crow when he told him that he had a sweet voice? Yet one of the most musical sounds in nature proceeds from the crow. All the crow tribe, from the blue jay up, are capable of certain low, ventriloquial notes that have peculiar cadence and charm. I often hear the crow indulging in his in winter, and am reminded of the sound of the dulcimer. The bird stretches up and exerts himself like a cock in the act of crowing, and gives forth a peculiarly clear, vitreous sound that is sure to arrest and reward your attention. This is no doubt the song the fox begged to be favoured with, as in delivering it the crow must inevitably let drop the piece of meat. The crow in his purity, I believe, is seen and heard only in the north, before you reach the Potomac. There is an infusion of a weaker element, the fish-crow, whose helpless feminine call contrasts strongly with the hearty masculine caw of the original Simon. In passing from crows to coloured men, I hope I am not guilty of any disrespect towards the latter. In my walks about Washington, both winter and summer, coloured men are about the only pedestrians I meet, and I meet them everywhere, in the fields and in the woods and in the public road, swinging along with that peculiar rambling, elastic gait, taking advantage of the shortcuts and treading the country with paths and byways. I doubt if the coloured man can compete with his white brother as a walker. His foot is too flat and the calves of his legs too small, but he is certainly the most picturesque traveller to be seen on the road. He bends his knees more than the white man, and oscillates more to and fro or from side to side. The imaginary line which his head describes is full of deep and long undulations. Even the boys and young men sway as if bearing a burden. Along the fences and by the woods I came upon their snares, deadfalls, and rude box-traps. The freedman is a successful trapper and hunter, and has by nature an insight into these things. I frequently see him in the market or on his way thither, with a tame possum clinging timidly to his shoulders, or a young coon or fox led by a chain. Indeed, the coloured man behaves precisely like the rude, unsophisticated peasant that he is, and there is fully as much virtue in him, using the word in its true sense, as in the white peasant, indeed much more than in the poor whites who grew up by his side. While there is often a benignity and a depth of human experience and sympathy about some of these dark faces that comes home to one like the best one sees in art or reads in books. One touch of nature makes all the world akin, and there is certainly a touch of nature about the coloured man. Indeed, I had almost said, of the Anglo-Saxon nature. They have the quaintness and homeliness of this simple English stock. I seem to see my grandfather and grandmother in the ways and doings of these old uncles and aunties. Indeed, the lesson comes nearer home than even that, for I seem to see myself in them. And, what is more, I see that they see themselves in me, and that neither party has much to boast of. The negro is a plastic human creature, and is thoroughly domesticated and thoroughly anglicized. The same cannot be said of the Indian, for instance, between whom and us there can never exist any fellowship, any community of feeling or interest. Or is there any doubt but the Chinaman will always remain to us the same impenetrable mystery he has been from the first? But there is no mystery about the negro, and he touches the Anglo-Saxon at more points than the latter is always willing to own, taking as kindly and naturally to all his customs and usages, yea, to all his prejudices and superstitions, as if to the manner born. The coloured population, in very many respects, occupies the same position as that occupied by our rural populations a generation or two ago, seeing signs and wonders, haunted by the fears of ghosts and hobgoblins, believing in witchcraft, charms, the evil eye, etc. In religious matters also, they are on the same level, and about the only genuine showing Methodists that remain are to be found in the coloured churches. 
Indeed, I fear the negro tries to ignore or forget himself as far as possible, and that he would deem it felicity enough to play second fiddle to the white man all his days. He liked his master, but he likes the Yankee better, not because he regards him as his deliverer, but mainly because the two-handed thrift of the northerner, his varied and wonderful ability, completely captivates the imagination of the black man, just learning to shift for himself. How far he is caught, or is capable of being imbued with the Yankee spirit of enterprise and industry, remains to be seen. In some things, he has already shown himself an apt scholar. I notice, for instance, that he is about as industrious an office-seeker as the most patriotic among us, and that he learns with amazing ease and rapidity all the arts and wiles of the politicians. He is versed in parades, mass meetings, caucuses, and will soon shine on the stump. I observe also that he is not far behind us in the observance of the fashions, and that he is as good a church-goer, theatre-goer, and pleasure-seeker generally, as his means will allow. As a boot-black or newsboy, he is adept in all the tricks of the trade, and as a fast young man about town, among his kind, he is worthy his white prototype, the swagger, the impertinent look, the coarse remark, the loud laugh, are all in the best style, as a lounger and starer also, on the street corners of a Sunday afternoon, he has taken his degree. On the other hand, I know cases among our colored brethren, plenty of them, of consciousness and well-directed effort and industry in the worthiest fields, in agriculture, in trade, in the mechanic arts, that show the colored man has in him all the best rudiments of a citizen of the States. Lest my winter sunshine appear to have too many dark rays in it, buzzards, crows, and colored men, I hasten to add the brown and neutral tints, and maybe a red ray can be extracted from some of these hard, smooth, sharp-gridded roads that radiate from the national capital. Leading out of Washington, there are several good roads that invite the pedestrian. There is the road that leads west or northwest from Georgetown, the Tennelly Road, the very sight of which, on a sharp, lustrous winter Sunday, makes the feet tingle where it cuts through a hill or a high knoll it is so red it fairly glows in the sunlight i'll warrant you will kindle and your own colour will mount if you resign yourself to it it will conduct you to the wild and rocky scenery of the upper potomac to great falls and on to harper's ferry if your carriage holds out then there is the road that leads north over meridian hill across pinney branch and on through the wood of Crystal Springs to Fort Stevens, and so into Maryland. This is the proper route for an excursion in the spring to gather wild flowers, or in the fall for a nutting expedition. As it lays open, some noble woods and a great variety of charming scenery, or for amusing moonlight saunter, say in December, when the enchantress has folded, and folded the world in her web, it is by all means the course to take. Your staff rings on the hard ground, the road, a misty white belt, gleams and vanishes before you. The woods are cavernous and still, the fields lie in a lunar trance, and you will yourself return fairly mesmerized by the beauty of the scene. Or you can bend your steps eastward over the eastern branch, up Good Hope Hill, and on till you strike the Marlboro Pike, as a trio of us did that cold February Sunday, we walked from Washington to Pumpkin Town and back. A short sketch of this pilgrimage is a fair sample of these winter walks. The delight I experienced in making this new acquisition to my geography was of itself sufficient to atone for any aches or weariness I may have felt. The mere fact that one may walk from Washington to Pumpkin Town was a discovery I had been all these years in making. I had walked to Sligo and to Northwest Branch, and had made the falls of the Potomac in a circuitous route of ten miles, coming suddenly upon the river in one of its wildest passes. But I little dreamed all the while that there, in a wrinkle, or shall I say furrow, of the Maryland hills, almost visible from the outlook of the bronze squaw on the dome of the capital, and just around the head of Oxen Run, lay Pumpkin Town. The day was cold, but the sun was bright 
and the foot took hold of those dark, dry, gritty Maryland roads with the keenest relish. How the levels of the laurel glistened! The distant oak woods suggested grey-blue smoke, while the recesses of the pines looked like the lair of night. Beyond the district limits we struck the Marlboro Pike, which, round and hard and white, held squarely to the east and was visible a mile ahead. Its friction brought up the temperature amazingly and spurred the pedestrians into their best time. As I trudged along, Thoreau's lines came naturally to mind. When the spring stirs my blood with the instinct of travel, I can get enough gravel on the old Marlboro Road. Cold as the day was, many degrees below freezing, I heard and saw bluebirds, and as we passed along, every sheltered tangle and overgrown field or lane swarmed with snowbirds or sparrows, the latter mainly Canada or tree sparrows, with a sprinkling of the song and maybe one or two other varieties. The birds are all social and gregarious in winter, and seem drawn together by common instinct. Where you find one, you will not only find others of the same kind, but also several different kinds. The regular winter residents go in little bands, like a well-organized pioneer corps, the jays and woodpeckers in advance doing the heavier work, the nuthatch is next, more lightly armed, and the creepers and kinglets, with their slender peaks and microscopic eyes, last of all. Footnote. It seems to me this is a borrowed observation, but I do not know whom to credit it. Now and then among the grey and brown tints there was a dash of scarlet, the cardinal grosbeak, whose presence was sufficient to enliven any scene. In the leafless trees, as a ray of sunshine fell upon him, he was visible a long way off, glowing like a crimson spar, the only bit of colour in the whole landscape. Maryland is here rather a level, unpicturesque country, the gaze of the traveller bounded at no great distance by oak woods, with here and there a dark line of pine. We saw few travellers, passed a ragged squad or two of coloured boys and girls, and met some coloured women on their way to or from church, perhaps. Never asked a coloured person, at least the crude, rustic specimens, any question that involves a memory of names or any arbitrary signs, you will rarely get a satisfactory answer. If you could speak to them in their own dialect, or touch the right spring in their minds, you would no doubt get the desired information. They are as local in their notions and habits as the animals, and go on much the same principles, as no doubt we all do, more or less. I saw a coloured boy come into a public office one day, and ask to see a man with red hair. The name was utterly gone from him. The man had red whiskers, which was as near as he had come to the mark. Ask your washerwoman what street she lives on, or where such a one has moved to, and the chances are that she cannot tell you, except that it is a right smart distance this way or that, or near Mr. So-and-so, or by such-and-such such a place, describing some local feature. I love to amuse myself, when walking through the market, by asking the old aunties, and the young aunties too, the names of their various yarbs. It seems as if they must trip on the simplest names. Bloodroot they generally call grubroot. Trailing arbutus goes by the name of trawling arbutus. Training arbuti flower and ground ivory. In Virginia they call woodchucks moonucks. On entering Pumpkin Town, a cluster of five or six small whitewashed blockhouses towing squarely on the highway, the only inhabitant we saw was a small boy who was as frank and simple as if he had lived on pumpkins and marrow squashes all his days. Half a mile further on, we turned to the right into a characteristic southern road, a way entirely unkempt, and wandering free as the wind, now fading out into a broad field, now contracting into a narrow track between hedges, anon roaming with delightful abandon through swamps and woods, asking no leave and keeping no bounds. About two o'clock we stopped in an opening in a pine wood and ate our lunch. We had the good fortune to hit upon a charming place. A woodchopper had been there, and let in the sunlight full and strong. 
and the white chips, the newly piled wood, and the mounds of green boughs were welcome features, and helped also to keep off the wind that would creep through under the pines. The ground was soft and dry, with a carpet an inch thick of pine needles, and with a fire less for warmth than to make the picture complete, we ate our bread and beans with the keenest satisfaction, and with a relish that only the open air can give. A fire, of course, an encampment in the woods at this season, without a fire, would be like leaving Hamlet out of the play. A smoke is your standard, your flag. It defines and locates your camp at once. You are an interloper until you have made a fire. Then you take possession. Then the trees and rocks seem to look upon you more kindly, and you look more kindly upon them. As one opens his budget, so he opens his heart by a fire. Already something has gone out from you, and comes back as a faint reminiscence and home-feeling in the air and place. One looks out upon the crow or the buzzard that sails by as from his own fireside. It is not that I am a wanderer and a stranger now. It is the crow and the buzzard. The chickadees were silent at first, but now they approach by little journeys as if to make our acquaintance. The nuthatches also cry, Yank, yank, in no inhospitable tones. And those purple finches there in the cedars, are they not stealing our berries? How one lingers about a fire under such circumstances, loath to leave it, poking up the sticks, throwing in the burnt ends, adding another branch and yet another, and looking back as he turns to go to catch one more glimpse of the smoke going up through the trees. I reckon it is some remnant of the primitive man which we all carry about with us. He has not forgotten his wild, free life, his arboreal habitations, and the sweet bitter times he had in those long-gone ages. With me he wakes up directly at the smell of smoke, of burning branches in the open air, and all his old love of fire and his dependence upon it in the camp or the cave come freshly to mind. On resuming our march, we filed off along a charming wood path, a regular little tunnel through the dense pines, carpeted with silence, and allowing us to look nearly the whole length of it through its soft green twilight, out into the open sunshine of the fields beyond. A pine wood in Maryland or in Virginia is quite a different thing from a pine wood in Maine or Minnesota. The difference, in fact, between yellow pine and white. The former, as it grows hereabout, is short and scrubby, with branches nearly to the ground, and looks like the dwindling remnant of a greater race. Beyond the woods, the path led us by a colored man's habitation, a little, low-framed house on a knoll, surrounded by the quaint devices and rude makeshifts of these quaint and rude people. A few poles stuck in the ground, clapboard with cedar boughs and corn stalks, and supporting a roof of the same, gave shelter to a rickety one-horse wagon and some farm implements. Near this there was a large compact tent, made entirely of corn stalks, with, for door, a bundle of the same, in the dry, warm, nest-like interior of which the husking of the corn crop seemed to have taken place. A few rods further on, we passed through another humble dooryard, musical with dogs and dusky with children. We crossed here the outlying fields of a large, thrifty, well-kept-looking farm, with a showy, highly ornamental frame-house in the centre. There was even a park with deer, and among the gaily painted outbuildings I noticed a fancy dovecote, with an immense flock of doves circling about it some whiskey dealer from the city, we were told, trying to take the poison out of his money by agriculture. We next passed through some woods, when we emerged into a broad, sunlit, fertile-looking valley called Oxen Run. We stooped down and drank of its clear, white-pebbled stream, in the veritable spot, I suspect, where the oxen do. There were clouds of birds here on the warm slopes, with the usual sprinkling along the bushy margin of the stream of scarlet grosbeaks. The valley of Oxen Run has many good-looking farms, with old picturesque houses and loose rambling barns, 
such as artists love to put into pictures. But it is a little awkward to go east. It always seems left-handed. I think this is the feeling of all walkers, and that Thoreau's experience in this respect was not singular. The great magnet is the sun, and we follow him. I notice that people lost in the woods work to the westward. When one comes out of his house and asks himself, which way shall I walk? and looks up and down and around for a sign or a token, does he not, nine times out of ten, turn to the west? He inclines his way as surely as the willow wand bends towards the water. There is something more genial and friendly in this direction. Occasionally in winter I experience a southern inclination, and cross Long Bridge and rendezvous for the day in some old earthwork on the Virginia hills. The roads are not so inviting in this direction, but the line of old forts with rabbits burrowing in the bomb-proofs, and a magazine or officer's quarters, turned into a cow-stable by coloured squatters, form an interesting feature. But whichever way I go, I am glad I came. All roads lead up to the Jerusalem the walker seeks. There is everywhere the vigorous and masculine winter air, and the impalpable sustenance the mind draws from all natural forms. End of Winter Sunshine